Hey, Deserve listeners, a lot of you have been asking me to talk about the new trend on TikTok in which people are talking about their dissociative identity disorder symptoms or multiple personality disorder symptoms. A lot of people are thinking that these people are faking it, so let's get to it. Kim wrote in and and emailed the following and summarizes it pretty well. Would you be willing to talk about the recent trend of people faking dissociative identity disorder on TikTok? DID, or dissociative identity disorder. DID awareness has increased over the past few years, and along with it, there has been a trend developing where people, mostly teenagers, are faking DID on TikTok. A year ago, I believed in DID, but after seeing all these fakers on TikTok and the arguments presented by other psychologists who don't believe it's a real disorder, I'm I'm convinced that they are all faking or have been brainwashed by the same mechanisms used by harmful psychologists during the satanic panic era to implant their patients with memories and experiences. These people on TikTok are pretending that they are people of color. They pretend they are fairies. They pretend they are a thousand-year-old wizards. Additionally, these people on TikTok will use fictives, usually cartoon or anime characters, as part of their other personalities or factives, which are real people. And I feel this is damaging, especially to the real people the factives are based on. Namely, Bo Burnham has many people claiming they literally are him, and when speaking to these people, you must address them as Bo Burnham. A few influencers have already spoken out and asked people to please stop posing as them online. Would you please be willing to speak about this trend? Yeah, so first off, dissociative identity disorder is real. It is absolutely real. I could talk about all the research. I could have guests on the show and all, and I have had guests. I actually had one guest on the show and you can listen to it. It was an episode from 2019, and you can find it on our website, and you can also find it on YouTube. It's called Her Story of Erotic Transference and Dissociative Identity Disorder. It's a wonderful um, interview, and you really get a sense for dissociative identity disorder in that interview. But I've done episodes, other episodes. I've done some deep dives available to oldie patrons. Again, you can go to the website and search for those. And if you become a patron, you get access to those. All the trauma experts and dissociation experts that I know of absolutely will state and uh, find that dissociative identity disorder is real. It isn't something that is completely all faked. Now, having said that, it can be faked, and it has been faked in the past, sometimes famously, like Sybil, the book and the movie in the 70s, uh, talks about a case or it was revealed to be a fraud. And so, and it continues to be faked. In fact, one study found that 10% of patients claiming to have DID were indeed faking it. Usually by overdoing their symptoms, it was clear that they were, they were faking it. Usually when people are faking it, they're trying to get out of a crime. They're trying to manipulate people in some way, trying to get attention or something. However, another set of studies have found that it's actually difficult to determine the difference between someone who's faking it and someone who legitimately has DID. So we have to take that into consideration. So regarding whether or not it's a real thing or not, again, take it from me and take it from all the experts when we talk with people, and I'll get more into it later, it's, it's really clear that it's real. There, most people, in fact, everyone that I've talked to that presents with DID, they're not getting anything out of it. In fact, they're getting a lot of negative things out of it, stigmatization, um, demoralization, you know, just a lot of things that you wouldn't want. You know, the, the, the idea that somehow faking that you had a mental disorder, somehow you, you have a net gain, that usually isn't, isn't the case. The other thing to think about is how do we know any of the disorders are real? And even taking it further, how do I know emotions are real? So for example, when someone is sad and they tell me that they're sad, how do I know they're not faking that they are sad? I can't know. I just have to take their word for it. I might see certain markers, so certain things might cohere, they might be crying, they might typically not be lying to me or there's not a lot of evidence of them lying to me, but I'll never know. There's no blood test for sadness. I don't know, I just have to take their word for it. The same with depression. If someone suffers from major depressive disorder, I have to take their word for it. Could they fake it? Absolutely, you could fake major depressive disorder, and some people do. The same goes for dissociative identity disorder. There's no way to really know if someone has it. You can't take a blood test for it. There's no biological marker of it. But 
take it from me, the experts who actually will treat this, they absolutely believe that it is a real thing, as with all the other disorders in the DSM. And they also recognize that some people will fake it. And the experts that I know are pretty good at detecting when it is fake. There's usually ulterior motives that people will present, like they're trying to get out of a crime or something. And then we start actually trying to make sure that they're not lying about it. But it'd be very, very strange for a patient to come in. And the, the other thing I'll talk about is when people present in our office that have who have d d dissociative identity disorder, they almost never present with DID. They never. They almost never say, "I have DID." Usually, they present with depression, or their relationships are falling apart, or they're uh, suicidal, or they're having lapses in memory and they can't figure out why. And then we start the interview and we start talking about it, and then we figure out, "Oh, there's these different alters." A lot of people come into treatment, they don't even know the other alters exist, or one of the alters that commonly will front the personality doesn't, uh, isn't fully conscious of the fact. They kind of know there's other alters, but they don't really know. And some people are very terrified of it. So the other thing that you talked about in your email is that it was, you know, there's a history in our profession of occasionally we will induce things in our patients, meaning that we will influence them, brainwash them in a sense to believe certain things, like they were sexually abused. There's a lot of famous cases in the past. And that happens sometimes. And psychologists, clinicians can also induce dissociative identity disorder in a client. They wouldn't actually have, the patient wouldn't actually possess DID, but they would act like they did have it, and then the client and therapist would just brainwash themselves into believing that, it, that it's there. And that happens, but a lot of other disorders are also induced. So just because DID has been induced, just because DID has been faked, doesn't mean they all are fake or they all are induced. And frankly, when lay people claim that it's always fake, they are harming people with actual disorders here. To say that it's all fake, it's all a conspiracy, it's all just trying to get attention, there's enough stigma out there already. We don't need to add to it. Now, can it be faked? Is it faked? Yes. But is it all fake? No. Now, it might be good if I talk about dissociation in general for a second. When we are young, when we're children, zero to six or something, we have an innate mechanism available to us, uh, uh, apparently, to help us cope with trauma and with fear. So when you expose a zero to five-year-old child to chronic and intense fear through abuse or chaos or war or something, and the child is experiencing, experiencing this chronic terror, sometimes at the hands of their parents, then there's this mechanism available called dissociation, and there are various different forms of it. Some of it you kind of check out and become hazy and almost in a trance. Other times you depersonalize, and other times you develop dissociative identity disorder. All these are dissociative mechanisms that are actually useful to humans when they're very young so that they can cope with trauma that is happening. The idea goes with dissociative identity disorder is that certain alters will be protected so like a child self will be protected. So say you're five years old, you're going through trauma. A child self will allow, will be pushed to the side when the trauma is happening. And another alter will step forward and take the brunt of it. And this alter sometimes is the protector, sometimes it's the traumatized one or the fragile one or whatever. And so this bifurcation in the personality continues to happen through various different circumstances so that each alter can cope with a specific task. It's, it's just one of the ideas. And there are various different models of how to see it. But oftentimes when you have a, a set of alters and you have dissociative identity disorder, that is a cause of trauma. I've never known someone with DID that wasn't significantly chronically traumatized when they were young ritualistic abuse, this kind of thing, then you, as a, as a young person, you have this ability to cope with a very, very difficult situation. You can survive it mentally. And the problem, though, is that once you develop that mechanism of dissociation, whether it's any form of dissociation, it typically will last into adulthood when you don't need it anymore. And then something will trigger you, a minor thing, like your boss is criticizing you, and boom, you're 
your alter will switch or something will happen dissociation wise because your body thinks that you're about to experience a lot of abuse when in fact you're actually not going to experience that. And this can be extremely distressful for people. It is not fun. The way that people talk, you know, when, when people are saying, oh, they're all faking it. I get the impression that people think that dissociative identity disorder is a fun experience. It is not a fun experience to the point where research shows that 70% of those people uh, diagnosed with DID have attempted or completed suicide in the past. Attempted or completed suicide. 70%, that's a lot of people. So there's a lot of pain, a lot of suffering. And it kind of makes sense when you think about what it's like to have DID, particularly before you get treatment. You have memory problems, meaning that you'll have whole blocks, maybe even weeks, where you don't even remember what happened because a different altar was fronting. Obviously, you have trauma reactivity that is not necessarily connected to your dissociative identity disorder because you were traumatized growing up, a lot of complex trauma, self-hatred, fragmented self states. You know, it, imagine that. Imagine that part of yourself, part of who you are is actually fragmented and not available to you right now. That's a terrifying thing before you get treatment and you start actually getting to know the alters better. Some alters actually will conflict and will push in different direction. One wants to do this thing, the other one wants to do that thing. One wants to buy a new car, the other one says we can't afford it. And then when the one who wants to buy a new car is fronting, they buy a new car and then the other alters have to deal, crap, we just bought a new car, we don't wanna buy that, now we have to take it back. So that can be extremely difficult. It's a feeling of being completely out of control and your brain just isn't working right. It's very, very distressing. And so when people act like, oh, they're just acting like they have DID and it's all fun and games. It is not. It is extremely painful, extremely distressing to the point where a lot of people, most, think and attempt suicide. The prevalence is about somewhere between 1 and 2% in the United States, which means that it's extremely one of the more rare disorders in the DSM. Now, in therapy, in the past, what we were looking for, would, we, was trying to, we were trying to integrate all of the alters so that we would have one full self that never switched between different alters or personalities. But we learned over time that that is extremely difficult to attain. And to try that actually can harm people. So we might try that a little bit, play around with it a little bit, but usually we switch to a different um, uh, treatment goal, which is to... Uh, do the following. One, we want to help the person become aware of their disorder. And we want to normalize it and destigmatize it for all of the alters. Because that's the other thing in therapy, you have to provide therapy for each of the alters. And typically there's around, you know, 10 to 20 alters, maybe five. And each of those alters need therapy. Now, sometimes other alters will know that they're in therapy even though they're not fronting. Anyway, I won't go into the details, but the other thing you want, so you have to destigmatize, help them feel okay, it's normal, they, it's a, there's a good reason why they have this coping mechanism, help them when they are in the past, and there's a way to live with it, and we can move forward. And that, that's usually a huge part of therapy, because they come into therapy usually in a lot of distress, a lot of fear, and a lot of confusion. The next step is we want to look at trigger awareness management, which is pretty, trigger awareness and management which is pretty much the standard for all dissociative disorder treatment. In other words, we want to be able to uh, help the person identify what triggers different involuntary switching, what sort of you know, situations, whether it's someone that's criticizing them or maybe they're stressed out about paperwork or something. You know, whatever it is, they will become aware of it first. You know, so, oh, I, I noticed that when this happens, this alter seems to come forward and helping them to understand that. Because sometimes you want to manage that. You want to say, well, I don't, I, you know, I'm on a date right now. I don't want my five-year-old girl self to come out right now. I want, I want at least one of the adults to come out. And knowing what triggers the five-year-old girl in me to come out can help me manage it better. The other thing we want to do is we want to bring in all the family and friends and say, let's all work on this together. You want to have a coming out, if you will, and say, I have dissociative identity disorder. And I think that's what TikTok actually has to do with. I think some of the people on TikTok are actually in that step. They're saying, I'm coming out and, I, and I'm, I'm sharing my experience, which is important to do because it destigmatizes, it lets people, because you need to have everyone else involved. You know, if you're married to someone, your spouse needs to understand that you have different alters and what triggers those things. 
and how to communicate which, 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 with each of the altars. Uh, the other thing we want to do is we want to have cooperation between the altars. We want different altars to get along and, and have harmony between them because it's not always true. And then the last most long-term thing we want to do is we want to begin the, he- the healing process, which takes a long, long time through corrective experiences. And you can hear about that in that episode on uh, her, experience of, her experiences of erotic transference and dissociative identity disorder. She describes that pretty well. Um, now, hopefully at the end of this process, you know, or when we're getting into the later stages of therapy, the person with DID can accept themselves, they can love themselves, they can come out of the closet, they, they're getting support from others, and they're able to advocate themselves. And some people at this point will start calling themselves we. They will say, we are going out. We, we want a new car, that kind of thing. We as a system, okay? And some people will even name their systems because you, you have this group and so you want to name it, you know, like the Tyrion Lannister system or something or the, the strawberry system. That's fine. Not everyone does it. Okay. So let's get to TikTok. When I, I've watched a lot of the videos on TikTok and what I can say is that it's nearly impossible to tell if an individual TikTok video about DID is real or if it's fake. These are one minute videos, you know, three minute videos. As someone who assesses for DID, I'm here to tell you it takes a long time to understand, one, if they have DID, and two, if they're faking it, right? But my take on it is that, first, everyone just needs to slow down. There's a lot of people criticizing people on TikTok who are talking about their DID, and a lot of hate and almost bullying on them, and a lot of assumptions that it's fake, and I don't really know why people are doing this to those individuals even if they are faking, really. People don't usually fake for no reason. There's usually something going on there. If someone is faking anything on TikTok, it's usually coming from a place of pain. And so for us to pile on more pain to them and ridicule them, I just don't understand why you would want to do that. It's probably not harming you that they're posting a fake video on TikTok. So you really want to ask yourself, why am I so worked up about this? Why am I so worked up about this very small niche thing going on on TikTok? Is it, does it something, does it have something to do with myself? Am, am I seeing something in myself and these other people through projection and attacking it on the outside instead of attacking it on the inside? Am I jumping on a bully bandwagon? You know, that's a thing on the internet. So I just want everyone to just take it easy, take a breath, you know. All right. The next thing is my observation of TikTok is that some seem legitimately real to me in terms of these people probably do have dissociative identity disorder. Again, it's impossible for me to tell, but from the way they're talking, they, they're not being sensational about it. They are you know, talking in a mature way. They're trying to raise awareness. They're not using their altars in a sensational manner. They're not even necessarily trying to entertain. There's a lot of people on TikTok that are just like, hey, I have DID, and they're just talking about it. And I don't know if they're legit or not, but um, it, it seems like it's a good possibility that it's, that it's not faking. Now, can someone have legitimate DID on TikTok and also make a cringy video where you go, oh, that's sort of gross to me. Yeah, absolutely. You know, can someone with depression make a cringy video? Yeah. Can someone with social anxiety make a cringy video? Yes. So just because it's a cringy video where you're like, ew, this isn't the tone or this isn't the sort of art that I like to consume, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean it's fake. It just means that you're cringing to a video. Now, on the other hand, some of the videos do seem fake to me. I can't tell for sure, but some of the markers that sort of hint at some faking going on is when people seem uh, really thirsty for attention and they're uh, presenting it in a way that almost seems like it's for entertainment's sake and not necessarily for raising awareness sake or for self-expression sake. I don't know, you you can kind of tell, again, I'm not saying they're fake, I can't tell by just watching these videos. Now, can someone with DID make a video in which it's like, so some of the people were making videos in which they were rapidly switching. They would be recording and they'd be in one altar and then boom, they would be in another altar and then boom, another altar. And that's possible, but it's not very likely. It's certainly possible and I can't know for sure. I mean, certainly there are some people like that. And some people actually have a lot of control over their switching. Usually people don't have that much control over their switching. 
So when I see rapid switching and doing it for entertainment value, and they're frankly young, uh, because you know younger people, uh, I don't know, I don't want to be ageist, but <laughs> um, yeah, like I'll just say for me, when I was 16, and if I had TikTok back then, I can't imagine what kind of embarrassing things I would have created on TikTok, honestly. So I'll just say that. But um, the other thing I'll say is that switching can actually be very distressing for people, even after they've been in recovery for a long time. It can cause nausea. It can be very distressing. You can feel like you're passing out in a sense, or you can feel you can become disoriented for a while as you're switching. So it's not like switching is like, hey, I'm John. Hey, I'm Steve. And it, it's it, some people can do that, but usually it's it's not a pleasant feeling. Because just imagine, you know, just imagine you're sitting there, you know, watching TV with your friend, and then all of a sudden you switch to another personality, another alter comes forward, and you go away. That's not a good feeling. <laughs> These are different selves, different alters. And so it, it's not like just adopting a different identity. You know, like for me. Um, sometimes I'm a jock because I like to watch football and I played football as, you know, when I was a kid. And so sometimes when I'm around other jocks, we'll jock out. And some, I was a theater kid as well. So sometimes, but it's all me and I, I, I don't have, it's not a, it's not a switching of, of complete alters. It's just a, a different persona that comes forward. Anyway, so the other thing that I'll say is that some of the people seem potentially delusional, psychotic, schizophrenic, et cetera. So it, it stands to reason that someone with schizophrenia, someone who's delusional, having a break from reality, that they one of the delusions that they might have is that they have DID and that they are different selves. So it seems like that's entirely possible. There's a lot of people on the internet who are posting things that are likely schizophrenic or developing schizophrenia. So that's another possibility. I can't tell, obviously. Now, why would someone fake? That's a good question. You know, that's a good question to ask. Why? Why would you fake this? Well, one, I think it's because we've always had a fascination with the idea. I think we clearly, at least in our culture, the United States, have a we have a fascination with it. Fight Club, Tyler Durden, The United States of Terror, which is a TV show, Split, the M. Night Shyamalan movie. I think it's just interesting to think about having multiple selves inside of us. And I think that some people on TikTok are trying to capitalize on that fascination and they're faking it and trying to you know, get, get views. Another reason why I think people might be faking DID on TikTok is because we currently have a lot more fluidity regarding identity in general. For example, with gender, we are breaking from the binary, which is a wonderful thing. But I think some people are confusing that and extending it into dissociative identity disorder. And you know, along those lines, it's possible that as young people are developing, particularly maybe if you've been through a lot or you're prone to certain ways of thinking, you might feel like you have different alters and different selves and might convince yourself of that, but you actually don't actually have it. So some of the people, quote unquote, faking on TikTok might actually legitimately believe that they have it, but they have magical thinking, they are confused about it, or they're trying to run away from something that is difficult for them in their lives right now. Who knows? But you know, there's a lot of different possibilities that I could imagine happening. Now, in conclusion, what I'll ask myself is, is this a good thing or not? Is this a good thing that people are posting on TikTok legitimate and possibly fake representations of dissociative identity disorder? I don't know. On one hand, it's raising public awareness, which is good. It hopefully is destigmatizing it. And those with dissociative identity disorder are given a chance to express themselves, part of their coming out process and saying, hey, world, look at me, uh, understand me, and uh, know me so that when you interact with me, you can know what's happening for me and don't be afraid of it. Because that's another thing is that a lot of depictions of DID in movies and TV shows often will associate it with crime, like the M. Night Shyamalan movie uh, Split, that uh, we often will associate just, you know, just mental disorders with murder. And that's just like not an association that makes any sense when you look at the data. So... So on one hand, it could be a good thing. On the other hand, it could be a bad thing because all I'm hearing from people, maybe it's just my cultural pocket or people emailing me, is everyone 
hating everyone on TikTok for talking about it because they think it's all fakery. And I am worried that there'll be a backlash against people with DID and the, even the concept of DND, uh, not DND, DID, and that people who are already experiencing destigmatization and self-hatred will hate themselves even more. I'm worried about that. So again, we just w you can watch a video and wonder, but before you interact, really you know, think carefully about what you're doing. So that is my take on what is happening. Again, it's a real thing. Uh, it, it can be faked, and it has been faked, as most disorders can be faked. It has been induced before in, from, client, from therapists to patients before, as other disorders have as well. And we're usually trying to help people to live with their disorder. The disorder is extremely distressing to people, and no one would – you would not want the disorder. <laughs> and so uh, if, if someone was fake – you know, the, when people come into my office and they're suffering from it, it is a miserable experience, miserable. The people I've treated with dissociative identity disorder in the beginning when I first meet them, we're talking like, I don't know, like one to four years where – Every time they come into my office, they're miserable because of all the, all the trauma they went through, the switching that's happening for them, the feeling of being out of control, the confusion. It is extremely distressing. You feel very much out of control. You don't feel in control of your own body. I mean, just imagine being, feeling like you're being possessed by someone else and that other thing, other person is doing things with your body. That would be, that would be distressing. Over time, we help the different alters harmonize and, and work together and not hurt each other in those processes. But in the beginning, it's, it's, it's very, very distressing. And so no one would want to fake that. <laughs> no one would want to have that much misery in their life. You know, so it's, it's, a, it's a real thing and it makes total sense. It coheres together, especially when you think about all the other dissociative disorders that no one claims are fake. No one claims that other, you know, depersonalization or these other dissociative disorders are fake. Why? I don't know. Uh, I think it's because I, th I think dissociative identity disorder suffers from uh, – it benefits and suffers from one aspect. I think people are fascinated with it. No one's fascinated with depersonalization disorder. I don't, I don't hear that, you know, talk. But people are fascinated with DID, and I think it benefits from that by raising awareness, but it, it disbenefits from it. It's you know, disadvantaged by the fact that people uh, are almost kind of like jealous of people with DID or something. I don't know. And so then they tear it down. I don't know. Anyway. All right. That does it for that episode of Psychology in Seattle. Everyone out there, please take care of yourself because you deserve it. You really, really do.